everyone. Today I'll be talking about nutrient circularity for sustainability in beef supply chains. And I'll compare the performance of three manure shed approaches. I am a rangeland management specialist at USDA Agricultural Research Service at the Hornada Experimental Range in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Thanks to the Long-Term Agroecosystem Research Network, I get to work with other scientists across the U.S. and Canada interested in evaluating strategies so that agriculture can be sustainable, resilient, and climate smart. You might ask, what is sustainable, resilient, and climate smart agriculture? Well, the way that we're thinking about it currently, and it is an evolving science, is that it's agriculture that minimizes trade-offs and maximizes co-benefits among environmental and socioeconomic goals. So each of those words, sustainable, resilient, and climate smart have their own visions and their own definitions, but really it boils down to, we have a lot of these types of goals in these different domains and we wanna minimize trade-offs. As many of you know, and as many of you experience, stakeholder engagement and co-production of knowledge are critical to meet these visions and to really transform agriculture um, into these visionary approaches. We are inspired by systems level challenges in the LTAR network and specifically the group of authors that's working on this, the work in this talk. Um, we are specifically interested in these types of challenges. So supplying socially acceptable beef, redistributing geographically concentrated nutrients, and measuring the trade-offs of agricultural innovation. So really recognizing there's no silver bullet that can solve all of these issues with those few, with, with no trade-offs. And so really understanding the science around trade-offs of, of innovations. And so as many of you know, and as in the space that you're working in, systems level challenges require systems level solutions. And some of the types of systems that we work in in LTAR are the our farming systems. Um, and Al Rotz might be in the audience with you today. So Al Rotz is a big expert on farming system modeling. He's also a co-author on this talk. Um, supply chain systems and regional food systems. So we're really investigating nutrient circularity as a systems level solution to systems level challenges. So one definition of nutrient circularity is recovering nutrients from residuals such as manures and post-harvest byproducts and reusing them for further agricultural production. Part of this is also reducing the use of nutrients and resources where possible, but that this is a nice basic definition of nutrient circularity. Some approaches that I've heard about and read about and have encountered in my work include substituting food co-products and wastes for conventional animal feeds. So another word for co-products that you might also hear is byproducts, but at waste to work, nothing is a byproduct because it's all worthwhile, maybe. Um, another approach is substituting manures or biosolids for commercial fertilizers. And other approaches are both of these, entail both of these together. So in this symposium, um, and thanks to Rob Minan for moderating, and thanks to the other speakers in this session, um, we are focusing on the Manure Shed Initiative, which I know that Rob already defined for you as um, the land surrounding animal feeding operations where manure nutrients can be recycled to meet a variety of goals. Um, and so I'm thinking today in this talk about the Manure Shed Initiative as a framework for providing spatially explicit information and knowledge about where and how nutrient circularity could actually work. Because I think we all know it's pretty darn complicated. And so the Manure Shed framework really gives a roadmap or a framework of where and how and when this, this could work. So we are focused on supplying that socially acceptable beef in the age of um, climate change concerns, um, land use concerns. And so I just want to take a minute to explain the a generalized supply chain of cattle originating from ranches and pasture lands of the US and Canada. So over on the left, there are some inputs, maybe some innovative inputs into the supply chain, um, such as different types of genetics or precision ranching. 
But what I really like to focus on are these um, components of the ranch, the feedlot, um, packing, packing and marketing. So here I have all the inputs in green. And so on the ranch level, we, we split this out to cow calf production, stocker production, and in some cases taking stocker all the way to finish. Um, but the standard approach with cow calf and stocker is that at a certain age, they're sent to feedlots to be fed on grain um, where manure is concentrated. Um, after the feedlot, they're processed and packaged and then um, marketed either locally or nationally. And so, if, so really our focus of a lot of this work that I'll be talking about today is the stuff in green. So hay are, is, is a major input into the beef supply chain, wheat um, and corn in, um, in different phases. <clears throat> And so another piece of the supply chain that's really important to consider is the concentration of feedlots. So here you see blue as grazing lands or places, counties or municipalities in Canada where um, there is cow-calf production. And so you can see that that's across the whole country and the arable parts of Canada. Um, when I say country, I mean U.S. in this case, and then feedlots being more concentrated. They're in the middle of the U.S. and in southern Alberta. And then you can also see that there is a spatial correlation with the feedlots and the packing or processing plants. Um, the corn belt there is outlined in green. And so that's really a place where the majority of corn for both the Canadian beef supply chain and U.S. supply chain is grown. Um, also on this map in brown outlines is where hay is greater than 50% of the cropland in that county or municipality. So those are the places where there's a lot of hay production. And so as you'll see in a bit, we're interested in, in some of these places where you have a blue polygon with some brown around it. That's what we're calling a hay grazing agro ecosystem. And that's part of one of our analyses. Okay, so what did we do? So we looked at three different manure shed approaches for nutrient circularity, and then we um, looked at their trade-offs in terms of those five types of goals that I explained earlier. So, so the socioeconomic and environmental goals that I showed in that flower. So the three types of manure shed approaches that we looked at were local transfers. So kind of the status quo or business as usual is major beef feedlots working with their local social networks to transfer manure nutrients um, to recipient croplands um, after they use it on their own places. So it's these local transfers with kind of ad hoc um, transfers based on their, their social network to their communities. Another approach is more aspirational. So it's a regional coordination where you look for hot spots of manure nutrients and then um, find these clusters of source counties or counties where manure phosphorus or manure nitrogen is in surplus of the cropland assimilative capacity of those counties. And then identify the counties around that source area that could assimilate the, that manure or you know, act as sinks. This is the approach that both Rob and Ray talked about um, in their talks. I, um, and then a third approach is supply chain coordination. So looking at different components of the beef supply chain and thinking about taking those manure nutrients from the feedlots, transporting them back to those hay grazing agro ecosystems or those grazing land areas to use to grow hay instead of using fertilizer. So that is a kind of a different approach. It really um, focuses on telecoupling or the idea that there's systems that are distant from each other, but that are linked through flows of resources. Okay, so more detail on what we did. So for this local transfer approach, we conducted a series of interviews, thanks to our co-author, Gwenda Meredith, who's a social scientist, um, conducted a series of interviews with um, the major beef feedlots of the US and ask them about their feed imports and manure transport and some other um, practices. Um, importantly, so the dots on this page represent the general location of where the feedlot interviews took place. And then the size of those bubbles is the amount of phos manure phosphorus that's exported from systems in the beef feedlot systems in those locations. And that's based on integrated farm system modeling from Al Rott, who I introduced before, hopefully is in the audience. Um, anyway, so what we found here was that these are quotes about, um, 
So again, this is two types of data. This is modeling estimates based on a survey that LROTS conducted with co-authors a few years ago, and then qualitative data from Gwender um, who asked questions of the few bot managers. So we see that um, essentially a lot of the B feedlots do rely on local contacts and they don't, and the manure does not travel very far, 50 miles at the very greatest, but the average of all this, these discussions was about 10 miles or 16 kilometers. So we took this, so looking at this second approach with this regional manure shed approach, this is again the type of analysis that Ray explained and that I think Rob highlighted as one of his analyses in his talk. But so basically in the middle there, you can see the source area or that, that beef feedlot um, hotspot. And then the green surrounding that are the recipient sink counties. So we used this analysis approach um, that we developed in a paper a couple of years ago in, in agricultural systems. Um, and so that's the regional coordination. This really takes a lot of um, top down, bottom up, a lot of coordination just to say, okay, all crop lands are going to be used as, as recipients for the surplus from this feedlot. And then for this third approach, we used a bunch of different types of data um, from, from Canada, um, from kind of local sources in Canada, local sources in Florida, and local sources in New Mexico as example systems where there where grazing cattle is very predominant and where there's a lot of hay production for the beef cattle. And so what we did was we calculated the amount of hay nutrients the amount of nutrients that are grown in hay for grazing cattle in those three hay grazing systems, then the amount of manure nutrients that are exported from those systems with their cattle who go to feedlots, produce the, produce the manure in feedlots, identify the recoverable manure nutrients from those feedlots that's available to send back out to those hay systems. So that's really more of this circular manure shed approach and really relying on different components of the supply chain to be talking to each other and to be highly coordinated, which has its pros and cons, which I'll discuss in a second. So again, there's three hay grazing landscapes, Western Canada, Florida, and New Mexico. Calculate the amount that of hay, phosphorus, and nitrogen that is fed to grazing cattle. Calculate the, um, the number of cattle that go to feedlots, what they produce in feedlots, and what can be sent back out to the hay fields to use instead of fertilizer. I hope that's clear. I'm ready for some questions on that one. Um, so what have we learned? So we learned that in terms of nutrient magnitude and transport differences, um, we have some differences in these, in these approaches. So in this local transport approach, we estimated that a single feedlot could export up to 256 megagrams or 1,000 kilograms of manure phosphorus per year we found in the Texas Panhandle area, but it goes a short, short way, um, 16 kilometers or, or fewer, 10 miles or fewer. With this regional coordination, we have the opportunity to really export quite a bit of manure nutrients. So the example that we use, and I forgot to mention this, was in southwestern Oklahoma, which is part of the beef feeding belt. So up to eight, you know, 8,000 plus megagrams of manure phosphorus per year is, um, is produced in those five source counties. Those five counties can assimilate about 6,000 <clears throat> megagrams of the nutrients, this is phosphorus, in their own croplands, and then left over about 2,100 megagrams for export out to those sink counties. The transport there is necessarily a bit farther, about 30 kilometers to, to fill that those the buckets or the bins of the sink counties and the cropland need. So the supply chain coordination, as complicated as it is, um, so the I so it's it was interesting to find that for both the New Mexico and Florida hay grazing agroecosystem, so the hay requirements, um, about 30. 34 and 36% of those hay nutrient requirements could be met by the manure nutrients transported from the feedlots. Um, so that's equivalent to about 450 megagrams of phosphorus in the New Mexico case and 410 megagrams in the Florida case. In the Western Canada case, only 6% of the hay needs could be met 
by um, the feedlot manure from the cattle exported from those hay grazing systems. That has to do with less time on feed in the um, in the Canada systems and also just the vast amount of hay um, and land that we're dealing with. But really it had more to do with the um, number of days on feed, which is less in Canada because of the some of the overwintering um, practices um, and, and grazing on snowy glands. Um, so anyway, so then um, the transport distances are much farther for this supply chain approach. So up to 647 kilometers on average for the New Mexico case from those food lots back to the hay grazing areas, 1884 kilometers for Florida and 1587 kilometers for Western Canada. And this is an average of distance from those feedlot destination states, the centroids of those states back to the centroids of the, of the hay grazing area. Again, I know it's complicated, but I feel like we need to identify some of these realities in order to really understand what we can and can't do with nutrient circularity. And um, we are using these data about magnitude and magnitudes of nutrients and transport distances just to begin this broader assessment of trade-offs. So each of these colors represents a different system with the local recycling in yellow, regional coordination in green, and that supply chain or international um, system in purple. And as you can see, so the, the nodes that go out farther have higher scores. And this is definitely subjective so far. You know, the hard data that we have is about the nutrient, is the transport distances and the nutrient magnitudes. We're starting to be begin this discussion amongst ourselves about these different trade-offs among these goals for sustainability and resilience. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss these more in the Q&A. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. And I hope you have a great conference. And I'm ready to take questions. Thanks. So she sent a, she sent a, a chat that she had a correction already. Uh, she was online participating that when she mentioned the regional analysis being done in Oklahoma, it was actually done in Kansas. So she made a, a, a speaking error on that uh, detail. 